you know the difference now, I think, between maximization and optimization. You're going to actually have too much of a good thing, and in this, and particularly when people throw in a few things that maybe aren't so wonderful. You know, I, could, I myself think think back every time somebody talks about dynamic stochastic general equilibrium to George Lishtime's old remarks that you know, structuralism was worse than Stalinism because the first destroys the body but the second the mind and he didn't have to deal with dynamic stochastic general equilibrium. <laughs> anyway, let me get rolling here or we'll run out of time. Um, I think it's appropriate that given our subject, you know, which is the state and the financial crisis, that I greet you uh, sort of like I imagine that former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson would, which is uh, good afternoon, comrades. <laughs> and uh, then I want to, I know, I, I will ask you to indulge one more person to express their gratitude to Rob Johnson, who I know has worked incredibly hard, and George Soros for throwing this. Uh, and um, then we'll get right on to where, oh yes, all right, where the, I, I should explain, I have never done a PowerPoint before in my life. Uh, anyway, I want to just explain what we're trying to do in this paper. We knew from our previous work on um, the, the Bush side of the financial crisis that in fact uh, political considerations were right basic at the heart of everything that happened in the American financial crisis. That is to say, very simply, Geithner, Bernanke, Paulson, one, one thing they were always doing is trying to keep the system stable till after the election. They had a lot of help. If you read the Christian Science Monitor, you could find out that, uh, say, Barney Frank shared the same noble ideal. He said he just didn't want to deal with reform legislation until after the election. And so a lot of things that happened uh, like the use of the federal home loan banks to uh, sort of a, a very under-publicized use of those banks to sort of stabilize uh, other banks in distress, or even Freddie and Fannie went down in part because they were used to try to stabilize uh, the system. Uh, <clears throat> we knew that politics ran all through this, but, you know, you can't find it. Uh, in the rest of the literature on this stuff. And indeed, in the whole of sort of economics and people's think, I, am I right? Because I, I would occasionally go out for a walk, I confess. Was Dominique Strauss-Kahn's reference to Latvia the first time somebody mentioned the word election here? I mean, it's really something of a problem. And there, it's sort of like a Jane Austen problem of sensibility. It's not just a question uh, of thinking. It's like, you remember, like Emma, it's a character who's smart, seems to know what's going on, and just doesn't see certain things and keeps screwing everything up as a result of it. Uh, whatever we're going to do with new economic thinking, for sure, politics has got to be a little more in it. I'm not, neither I nor Rob, I'm sure, is trying to tell you that politics is the heart of economies or things like that. I mean, when I have students ask me questions, I always tell them, look, don't try to find the meaning of your life in politics. Get a life first. It's just, though, that if you want to understand how things can go completely wrong over a long period of time, uh, you've got to understand, yeah, you really better understand the moral hazard problem, things like campaign contributions and especially uh, regulatory problems. So in our paper, we thought, well, well, all right, we'll try to do this. And of course, we threw out the representative agent model uh, right off. And I rejoiced yesterday to see Joe Stiglitz say, oh, we're going to get rid of the, in the new macroeconomics of the future, we'll get rid of the representative agent. Now, I'll tell you when that thought first occurred to me, and that was when I saw a W.C. Fields clip uh, from the Depression. And there, had, Fields had somebody come over to him and say, well, he'd seen this very moving tombstone in uh, Philadelphia a banker and an honest man. And Fields' response was, gee, things must really be tough in Philly. They're burying people in pairs. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. So just very quickly, what uh, we tried to do was look at uh, all the large country cases of bailouts. You don't get a big in if you do that. Uh, and I'm going to present just a touch of this and then turn it over, turn it over to Rump. 
we then go on to examine the American case in a little bit more detail. And the reason for that is this time something is different. I mean, the American case is really extraordinary. Not only is it, I think, already clear that you are not going to get much in the way of real change uh, in the uh, financial legislation. At best, you might get some legislation that allows you to wind down uh, bankrupt enterprises in a slightly easier way, although in fact it's not clear they didn't really have that authority already, no matter how many times the Treasury says they didn't. But you're not going to see serious too big to fail uh, resolution, and, and you're not going to see uh, probably a whole host of other things you ought to see, like good consumer uh, protection regulation. I think that's clear in both the House and the Senate bills. Anyway, uh, the American case is worth thinking about, therefore, a little bit long, because we also think that, uh, I'm sorry to say it, I understand that, you know, the long literature on corporatism, the differences across comparative politics in Europe, when globalization hits a system, you begin to get money politics on the American model, so that while Europe hasn't arrived where we are yet, uh, you probably will, and you may not like it. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit about that, and we have a say, a slightly different approach to problems with regulation. We're going to actually try to show you how income inequality uh, does actually pollute a whole system of regulation. I mean, it's, it's, we know it's bad, or at least most of us think it's bad, although since I have to confess, I taught once at the University of Texas, and I did know people who would actually uh, yuck it up at the end of the day, how many of the downtrodden did you trot on today? I mean, that, they, that in the east, in the northeast where I now live, we don't do that sort of thing, we, even if they think it. Uh, anyway, so th that's the sort of broad thing. Now let me try to move to, we begin though with this uh, <clears throat> 19th century caricature from the uh, Orleanist period in France, um, the July 30th revolution. This, if you notice, is King Louis Philippe, and the people of France are pouring cash into him, and it's coming out into the banks of Europe. Uh, now, what this is actually, it's doing two things. Uh, the, car the caricaturists of that period typically portrayed the king as a pair, and they sort of are drawing on that tradition, uh, though he's a barrel here, because he, he has to also connect up with the, what is in English classical studies, the myth of the Danaea jar, uh, that was the sad story of the 50 daughters of King Danos who were told to marry people they didn't want, so 49 of them killed their husbands on wedding night, and they were condemned forever to wander through Hades, bringing bar what were to fill a barrel uh, that was, in fact, a sieve. They could never fill it. It was an impossible task. And frankly, bank bailouts uh, very much remind us of the Danaea jar. They, they do it in two ways. One of them you can all figure out real fast, which is that you know, mostly relatively less rich people pour cash down into the institutions of richer people. And then there is, of course, the problem uh, that we want to touch on at the end of the paper, which is if you are trying to cut your deficit by curbing income growth by, say, tight money and austerity, that turns into a kind of Danaea jar, too. You can never, you, you're basically, you get, as Herbert Hoover found out and many others uh, after him, uh, and also before him, y y your deficit uh, is wiped out by the, the it keeps get growing simply because the income fall uh, and the fall in tax revenues is so large. So anyway, uh, what we, uh, we, we want to look at only developed country cases and where the IMF doesn't play a role because it's not news. And we throw out the cases where you have, I mean, we, we take the point that several people of you made, made last, yesterday, that a bunch of small banks failing can aggregate into a big one. And you get three periods of, in the, um, in the modern period, you know, modern means different things in history here. It means, I guess, po post-1500. Here it's going to mean after uh, 1900. Anyway, uh, you get the cases from 2008, uh, then the 90s cases from Japan and Scandinavia, and in the 1930s from Germany, Italy, and the USA. Uh, and w our basic idea is the data's better on the first two groups of those. Uh, so we're going to sort of study those and then at the end talk just a bit about how conclusions might be modified by the depression cases. 
And we just basically ask, uh, we're, what we're, the idea is to try to grade all these countries and see if there's anything that explains the variation in the response there. And so the three key questions, you know, just did the authorities get quickly address it or did they stall? Did they do a Paulson uh, and stall forever? Did they do the Japanese uh, act, which was you know, many different uh, levels of stall, but it la went on for years? How did they handle the immediate bailout costs? And how did they address moral hazard implications of their bailout policies? Uh, and just quickly, you know it's immensely costly uh, these are from the IMF, the, these, what it costs in just capital injections and assets, uh, asset buying by the Treasury. There are lots more. There are contingent guarantees and things like that. Now, when you're trying to uh, sort of sort through this, you've got a problem. Because yeah, how do you value the guarantees? Uh, how do you deal with the massive expansion of central bank balance sheets? And, of course, there nobody collects statistics on accounting forbearance. Uh, and there, nobody has any um, serious numbers on, like, of these assets that states have purchased, how many are really going to go bad. You can be sure that a bunch of you follow, like, how the Fed deals, the, the, the accounting on made, the various maiden lane funds with the Fed. You know you're going to take some fairly large losses. Okay, so what we decided to do was uh, give up. That is to say, we can't possibly assess all this stuff. And in the spirit of um, Sir Peter Metaware's uh, injunction, science is the art of the soluble, we decided we would try to simplify this whole business uh, down into just a couple, uh, into, in some sense, two baskets. We, we would walk through each country's that uh, got, in, got involved in this crisis, and also the 90s cases. Um, and then we would try to sort of, how did they address moral hazard? Did you actually ask for some money back from the bankers? Uh, did you try to perhaps crimp their salaries or make the top folks resign? Uh, or, and further, would you maybe keep some, ca some chunk, if you're going to give them all this money, could you keep some equity for the public so the public gets some equity back? Um, and if you, know, if you tried to cost all this stuff out, you could uh, just kill yourself from the complexity. But in fact, it's not that hard to sort of sort most countries. And so we did it. Uh, and you know, it, it's a judgment call, but it's actually not that hard a judgment call. Now, it, we ought to also remark that I mean, most authorities didn't, tr hardly anyone except the Scandinavian countries, and with some nod to the British, tried really hard to make their bankers pay anything at all. You can see cases, like I, I went to school in Austria and I, I can read the local papers, and it was clear the Austrian government did not want to take over the banks. It had to take over, though when it did it, it finally got rid of some of the folks uh, and did crimp the salaries and things like that. There are other such cases, but there's, we haven't got time to go through them. Anyway, so here's what, what we discover when we did this, and put it up in a graph. Um, there are a couple economic variables don't help much to explain this, but look at this um, graph there. On one side we have voting turnout, and on the other the percentage of labor or socialist party strength, and then you have all the countries that sort of seriously did anything at all. I mean, now this is very mild stuff, but they actually did like make bankers pay a bit, they cost their salary, they crimped them, as against the ones that didn't. I should explain, uh, we know that, yes, the public companies and the auto companies in the U.S., uh, their executives got crimped uh, when their companies were taken over. But presumably all of you know that most of the major U.S. banks were allowed to buy their way out of TARP within months. And in fact, uh, off the uh, article that appeared, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, just before I flew over here, the 2009 bonuses were records. That's, there's nothing like that that's ever happened in the history of the globe. None of these previous stuff, not in the 30s, none in the, or the cases in the 90s, did bankers go off on that scale, uh, even though you might say sometimes, all right, they got away with what you would have said under old standards were murder, but now, now it's really quite amazing. Anyway, if you do that, it's pretty obvious what you see. Uh, I may add the Swiss, uh, if you know the case, allowed UBS to do more or less what the American banks did, uh, too. Uh, and so our suggestion is, uh, well, open your eyes. Uh, 
And in fact, there's some pretty interesting political variables. The claim is not that, uh, say, having a bunch of labor or socialist party folks in your parliament, not necessarily in power, uh, or having high voter turnout will solve your banking problem. It's like it's not a substitute for uh, equity, uh, pardon me, uh, capital, uh, capital requirements or restrictions on leverage. But this will protect you a bit. Uh, and in systems where the population has a hard time getting itself heard, it looks like they, uh, you will forgive the plain English, they get ripped off rather more. Now I'm going to stop and turn it over to Rob. One of the uh, anomalies at looking at the different cases is the United States, and as Tom mentioned, the uh, record bonuses were just extraordinary. Now, I myself worked with the, as a chief economist of the Senate Banking Committee during the SNL crisis, and as Tom mentioned in the first slide, the bailouts were done there. There was some muddiness about how the asset resolution was done uh, subsequently, and uh, probably some people made a good deal of money on, on mispricing. But there was nothing like the scale of what we saw from TARP to the present. And uh, perhaps the surprise is that, uh, at a superficial level, that the Democratic Party did not respond in a more uh, formidable way vis-a-vis -vis the bankers. And I, I don't think, we, as we look at this, as we're trying to turn things inside out and say, how does public, political structure constrain market behavior or shape market behavior, you can see that uh, <coughs> the uh, oops, I get, hmm. Oh, I grabbed the wrong one. Uh, so what what happened between the 30s Democratic Party and the current one? I don't think this is just merely a question of Obama's personality versus Franklin Roosevelt's. One thing that's very profound is that union strength declined in the United States from 30% to 12%, and by the way, of that 12, over 6% are public sector employees. Uh, there is no dues-paying membership base in the Democratic Party in contrast with many uh, progressive parties in Europe, and the role in money of money politics in the United States has absolutely exploded. We, uh, I guess, agree, and Tom has done a tremendous amount of work, uh, his book, The Golden Rule, on the investment theory of politics is something that uh, I would recommend to all of you. But the, but the idea of perfectly competitive neoclassical markets is analogous to the median voter problem. And we just don't think that's a framework which has much explanatory power in a world where to mobilize votes, to create awareness, to communicate with people, to shape their opinions with psychological techniques that, that were developed in advertising are very formidable, requires enormous amounts of money. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, large-scale capital costs of running an election, when I talk even at this day to United States senators or congressmen, they estimate they spend more than 70 percent of their time raising money and very little time doing much else. The, uh, as I, there are different forms in which money politics has become very powerful in the United States, the first of which is campaign contributions, and I just mentioned. Uh, I'll go to the third, which is that con if you uh, see these recent papers by, you know, is it Alan Zabrowski and his co-authors, Ping Chen, Boyd, and I think Bridget Zabrowski, I don't know of much, maybe even, not even, uh, the quantum fund performs as well as the portfolios of senators and congressmen. Their outperformance of the market year after year is an extraordinary dimension uh, that must be explored in much greater depth in the United States if we restore our rulemaking making process to a uh, more solid basis. Uh, another thing that happened, and I, th I'm a living history of this, was that when I worked on Capitol Hill, Ronald Reagan took away the pensions of congressional staff persons and uh, told us we could rely on Social Security. And uh, as we'll see in the next slide, we believe that 
there's a very, very difficult problem now with the concentrations in income, or what I, we call the opportunity cost of doing good, where upper income people make so much more than what, what the uh, blue bar called max salary is measured from the Federal Senior, Senior Executive Service. It's essentially the top grade of civil servant, just under political appointee. Your top officials at the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the Securities Exchange Commission, are paid at that rate, and the uh, Federal Reserve's own pay scale is based on that. It's not identical to it, but it tracks very closely. And when we've looked at data that was much more difficult to assemble, it very much tracks the top one or one and a, uh, top one half of one percent of income. And as this gap has widened out, we must ask a question similar to uh, Andy Haldane's question of a doom loop whereby moral hazard begets market share, gets bigger bubbles and bigger crisis. Uh, we see an enforcement bubble here, which is the wider the, the opportunity cost of doing good, the harder it is for people to muster the will to in, uh, engage in adequate supervision and enforcement in the United States. Uh, finally, we looked at the comparative macroeconomic response. As you know from uh, historic banking crisis and, for instance, uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt's book, it tends to be the output costs that dominate relative to the uh, explicit bailout costs, however harmful they are for the government's reputation. We looked at the Scandinavian cases in the 1990s and the, the role of devaluation being small countries which would allow themselves to resume growth through uh, expenditure switching and, and devaluation was a very strong channel that perhaps isn't available to the United States at this time. <clears throat> in the Japanese case, we uh, were very sympathetic to the work of Richard Koo, who we've talked with a great deal when we were creating this paper, and we saw that official uh, forbearance coupled with financial deleveraging required sustained public spending, and that the mistake that was made with the turning off of fiscal uh, stimulus or, or attempts to consolidate the deficit and the New Deal mistake of 1936 when Roosevelt raised interest rates caused, we, we believe caused much, much more harm than good. Finally, as Tom mentioned, the earlier cases of Italy, Hoover in the United States and Germany in the 1930s uh, where cutting state expenditure with high unemployment uh, showed itself to actually deepen the downturn and through loss of tax revenue, and to some extent in the modern times, you would, we would imagine automatic stabilizers, you actually may, have, uh, may be harming the economy and increasing the deficit at the same time. Thank you very much.